How could two guitar legends from the 60s and the 70s, Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page, fall out with each other so badly that they ended up despising each other? Well, sadly, like a lot of these cases, it all comes down to money. Shall we? Hi, I'm Adam, welcome back to Music Mongoose. In the mid to late 60s, Eric Clapton had made quite a name for himself in England for his exceptional guitar playing abilities in bands like the Yardbirds, John Mayle and the Blues Breakers, and Cream. At the same time, Jimmy Page was becoming well known as one of the best session guitar players in the scene. He can be heard on The Who's debut single, some Rolling Stones songs, a smattering of Kink songs, and even Shirley Bassey's Goldfinger, among many others. As two prominent guitar players in the English music scene, they were very much aware of each other and their paths certainly had crossed. Their first public crossing of paths, well almost, was with the Yardbirds. Eric Clapton had joined the group in 1963 and by 1965 was a bit fed up with the direction they were going in. He thought their newest track, For Your Love, was too commercial, and so on the day of its release he quit the band. Not to leave them empty-handed though, Clapton suggested the group hire Jimmy Page as his replacement. Out of respect for Clapton, Page declined the offer. Page was also more focused on the producing side of his career rather than playing at this stage. And he was making a decent living from being a session musician, so he didn't see any reason to stop that and join the Yardbirds. Although, of course, he would end up joining the Yardbirds a year later in 1966, and we'll get onto that in a bit. At this point, Page had recommended another guitar player who was making a name for himself at the time, and who also happened to be a friend of both Clapton and Page, Jeff Beck. Jeff agreed, and he fit the bill perfectly. At this point, Jimmy Page worked on his record producing, and Eric joined John Mayle's Blues Breakers, where he further cemented himself as pretty bloody good at playing the guitar. The same year, 1965, Page would watch Clapton performing with John Mayle and the Blues Breakers in London. After the show, Page approached Clapton and told him about his newfound producing prowess. Soon, Page would be producing a recording session with John Mayle and the Blues Breakers. Clapton and Page grew closer as colleagues and friends, and even had sleepovers. Clapton stayed at Page's house during the recording sessions, and as guitar players tend to do, would often jam together when they had time off. Jimmy Page would later describe his relationship with Beck and Eric Clapton as arch buddies, which I think is a great way to describe the relationship. However, it was around this point in the story where events would set in motion the eventual falling out of Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton. You see, Page and Clapton, innocently enough, decided to record some of the jam sessions they had. They fiddled with the newest distortion effects while playing old blues standards. They were just big kids having fun. Back on the clock, Page would produce I'm Your Witch Doctor and Telephone Blues with Mail and Clapton, as well as Sitting on Top of the World and Double Crossing Time. Fun fact for you, the I'm Your Witch Doctor and Telephone Blues single would feature John McVie on the bass, who would of course go on to find huge success with Fleetwood Mac. Facts are fun, aren't they? Now let's talk about immediate records, as this becomes an important part of the story. The label was owned by the manager of the Rolling Stones, Andrew Oldham. It was founded in 1965 and focused on the London blues and R&B scene, They'd go on to sign Rod Stewart, Fleetwood Mac, and The Small Faces, among many others. When the label dissolved in 1970, they faced some pretty big controversies, the most notable of which was when The Small Faces accused the label of not paying them royalties. Back to this story though, Andrew Oldham had hired Jimmy Page to be a sort of in-house producer for immediate records. From this, Jimmy Page was hired to work on tracks from the likes of Chris Farlow, Twice As Much, and of course, John Mayle and the Blues Breakers. So the John Mayle and Eric Clapton sessions Jimmy Page had been producing were for the label immediate records. Things started really falling apart for Page and Clapton when Page made a big mistake. He told Andrew Oldham about the recordings from the jam sessions. Oldham reportedly forced Page to surrender the tapes, bringing both his and Clapton's contracts up. According to Oldham, he had every right to demand those tapes. They were produced by two people who at the time were under contract with immediate records. I argued they couldn't put them out because they were just variations of blue structures. Jimmy Page would later say. Not only did Oldham not care, he also forced Page to record overdubs of the tracks, which also happened to feature a handful of Rolling Stones members, including Mick Jagger, playing the harmonica of all things. 
Shortly after, the tapes were released to the public via Immediate Records. Eric Clapton had no knowledge of this, and understandably, it affected his trust and relationship with Jimmy Page. What's more, he didn't receive any royalties from those tapes either, tapes he didn't want released in the first place. And this ultimately is what caused the pair to fall out. And if it's any consolation, Jimmy Page is adamant that to this day he's never received a single penny from those tapes either, although of course Clapton never believed this. The pair stopped talking and parted ways to work on their own things, although their paths did cross in a strange way. In the late 60s, Clapton began dating Charlotte Martin, a French model. They broke up, and then Page would find himself dating Charlotte. They had a daughter together too, Scarlett Page. After the Blues Breakers, Clapton went on to form Cream and found moderate commercial success for a few years. Meanwhile, Page had finally agreed to join the Yardbirds, but only lasted two years before the group broke up. This, of course, led Jimmy Page to set up the new Yardbirds, which went on to, to become Led Zeppelin and so on and so forth. Led Zeppelin would cross paths with Eric Clapton and Blind Faith in Wisconsin for the Midwest Rock Festival. Page didn't manage to see Blind Faith performing, but Eric Clapton did see Led Zeppelin perform. They were very loud, Clapton said. I thought it was unnecessarily loud. I liked some of it, I really did like some of it, but a lot of it was just too much. They overemphasized whatever point they were making, I thought. Do you reckon that's a genuine criticism, or do you think he's still bitter from the falling out with Jimmy Page? In any case, Page would have thoughts on Clapton too. Clapton's a very tasteful player. I haven't seen him play since John Mayall days. I didn't see Cream. I didn't see Blind Faith shows. Despite the falling out, Jimmy Page always maintained his respect for Eric Clapton. Interestingly though, it would seem that Page intentionally avoided listening to Clapton's music, and also the music of other guitarists. While he was in Led Zeppelin, he consciously avoided listening to other guitar players. He wanted to lead the charge with his own style. I thought if I started to listen to everybody else like Eric and Jimi Hendrix, then I'd get bogged down with their ideas and start nicking their phrases, which I probably did do subconsciously, and I think everybody does. The pair would reunite again in 1983. Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton, and Jeff Beck would come together to play at Ronnie Lane's benefit concert for action into research for multiple sclerosis, which took place at the Royal Albert Hall. It's never been confirmed whether the pair actually made up at that event or not, but I'm sure that whole ordeal in the 60s still leaves a pretty bitter taste in the mouths of both Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton. In the 70s, Clapton would set up Derek and the Dominoes and release one of the best love songs of all time, Layla. And the song was born out of a weird love triangle involving him and George Harrison from the Beatles. You can click the video here to watch that one next. 